very glad to have you to have you both here um, for this this keynote kicking off this uh, this passive investing for busy physicians event. So I'm going to give a very brief bio and then let you all add anything uh, relevant and let you kick it off and I'll just be in the background. So uh, Danny Randazzo, I know very well. We work together at PassiveInvesting.com. He's one of the managing partners and uh, heads up finance, underwriting, analysis, uh, acquisitions in partnership with uh, with with Brandon and his team for our group, um, has a, just an amazing journey of financial freedom from working a very demanding uh, job, not, not a physician, but uh, probably put in close to physician hours uh, at times, and uh, really just with uh, great intent, intention and partnership uh, with his wife really set out on a path to financial freedom uh, through investing in real estate. And so he's going to have some amazing things to share. And, and Dr. Dr. Danny, I don't know you as well, but I've heard um, fantastic things. Uh, you're a physician and serial entrepreneur, have done over 100 million real estate and business transactions in addition to an incredibly impressive uh, resume on the physician side of things. So I'll let you speak to that a little bit more as well as it looks like you have uh, some really neat uh, just things you do to give back of your time and, and finances as well. So really pleased to have you all both here and I'm going to let you take it away. I will be here in the background if you need anything, but really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much, Andrew. I'll kind of kick things off um, for this keynote presentation this morning. And, and really what we thought would be valuable for all of you attending and listening is to have kind of like a fireside chat. So it's going to be um, more of Dr. Danny doing the talking and kind of sharing his story and me asking some questions and maybe providing some input just about my um, personal journey to financial freedom. But um, we'll, we'll keep hopefully the, uh, the medical chat brief, um, but a, a little bit more just about myself. And then I'm going to kick it over to Dr. Danny to kind of run through his background and story into um, real estate and financial freedom. But um, as Andrew alluded to in my previous life, I uh, was a corporate consultant. I worked for multi-billion dollar corporations to help them improve their financial performance and uh, revenue operations. Some of those clients were some of the largest, most well-known uh, health systems in the world. And <laughs> I would actually go in and help the finance team or, or corporate accounting um, improve revenue cycle operations, both on a hospital and professional side as these health organizations implement a new EMR system. So that'll be the last time I use the word EMR. I'm sure everyone needs a, uh, a weekend or at least a day off from that. Um, but we would go in and very strategically work with um, cost centers, practices, locations, working on their revenue recognition, um, accurately documenting, um, patient interactions so the correct charge codes could be billed, optimizing revenue for the organization, as well as generating the proper RVUs for the beloved physicians. So um, that was kind of my, my background uh, prior to getting into real estate. And really, my wife and I realized, you know, that job required a ton of travel, ton of time away from home. And so we eventually sold off everything we owned in San Francisco, out in the Bay Area, moved across the country to Charleston, South Carolina, started investing in real estate one property at a time. Um, I've done pretty much every type of real estate investment that's out there and realized that large multifamily, large self-storage, really any sort of larger scale real estate operation is a business that you can control and optimize just like a large health system as they acquire more locations in a region or bring on more medical professionals or private practices into their umbrella you can really um, optimize your business performance from that standpoint and so um, that's kind of my brief journey very much the entrepreneurial bug in getting um, these businesses started and our company, PassInvesting.com and, and the umbrellas of investments that we have. So with that, Dr. Danny, please 
Um, let's give the people what they want, as Andrew said. And we want to hear about your story um, into, you know, kind of how you got started to where you are today. And um, I'll probably chime in and ask some questions as we go. But over to you, please tell us who you are, how you got started, what your focus is, and, and all that good stuff. Yeah, for sure. Um, first of all, uh, Danny and Andrew and uh, Dan Hanford, who I think he's around here somewhere. I just want to thank you guys for putting all this on. Um, this is kind of truly the example of the, the what preceding the how, because, you know, when I talked to Dan about this um, a few months back uh, about physicians getting together with other physicians to, to kind of figure out how they became financially free and to share that information um, and the investment strategies, we really had no idea what it would look like. Um, but man, your team, uh, Leah, Hannah, and all the rest of them, uh, saw the vision, ran with it and really put together, uh, an amazing day and lineup. And I, I'm really super excited to be here and learn from uh, so many thought leaders in their respective areas. So thank you for, for doing this. Appreciate it. Um, a little bit about me. I, I'm a physician by training, uh, but I've been a full-time entrepreneur uh, for about the past eight years. In, in 2013, I found out that I had a, an autoimmune condition that was going to preclude me from practicing anesthesiology the rest of my life. I'm an anesthesiologist. Um, and, you know, while that hit me pretty hard, uh, I realized that I was still, you know, pretty young and I had a family to feed. Um, so those are issues that, that needed to be addressed, right? Um, and so I started looking at different ways that people have created generational wealth. I looked at uh, oil and gas, uh, didn't live in Texas, didn't live in Oklahoma, didn't have a big cowboy hat, didn't know anybody in that space. I kind of marked that off pretty quickly. Um, looked into paper assets. I know there's people who made wealth in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, 401ks, those types of things. Uh, but I saw my dad lose pretty much everything twice uh, in the stock market. So that, that didn't appeal to me. Um, I read a ton of books. Uh, sought a lot of counsel and found historically that it was real estate where most millionaires uh, created, maintained, and, and grew their wealth. So that's when I decided to focus on real estate. And I had a really good friend from medical school who was an ER doc, and um, he was kind of tired of trading his time for money at the time as well, and was looking for alternative ways to create wealth for his family. And, and he landed on real estate as well. And, you know, as most physicians know here that are joined, um, you know, we learned a ton in medical school, but where we really honed our craft was in residency, um, where we could, you know, mentor under someone who's going to keep us in some guardrails and, and had been there before and can guide us. So that's what we decided to do uh, in real estate. And we found guys who were doing very well in multifamily. We found mentors in that space. Um, we paid them well and we learned everything we could from them about real estate. And uh, we kind of morphed what they did and, and put it into to our business model. And um, we were able to accelerate our journey in real estate dramatically. Um, you know, I was able to replace my income as a physician in about 15 months. And, and after that, I never really looked back. He and I scaled up to about 800 units between us at the time. And uh, we felt like the market may be shifting a little bit. Um, so we wanted to diversify. Um, didn't realize it was going to be a historic bull market. But, you know, I, I believe in diversification, no matter what asset class we're talking about. So, I started diversifying into different areas, not unlike Danny of real estate. Um, so I, I've jumped into everything. So single family portfolios, um, flips, both in houses and land, um, mobile home parks, RV parks, um, commercial triple net like Dollar General, Walgreens, uh, dialysis centers like Fresenius. Um, started an opportunity zone fund, uh, was looking at opportunity zone investments. I had some capital gains from a sale of a business and uh, didn't really like what I was seeing. So I started my own and, and bought some land with that. I've uh, been involved in vacation rentals, both uh, property managed and Airbnbs, self-storage, pretty much anything from a real estate standpoint I've jumped into. And more recently, over the past few years, uh, I, I did delve into oil and gas and both in mineral rights. And you'll hear uh, Troy Eckert talk a little bit about that later on today and um, working interests, oil wells. Uh, I've used different strategies uh, in trading options. I'm not in the stock market per se, but in trading options that are, that are both safe and profitable. And uh, I've been active in the cryptocurrency and mining space. Uh, don't ask me a ton about NFTs right now because it, thankfully I've got a group um, that I'm leaning on heavily for that education. Uh, but suffice to say that I, I'm involved in that as well. Um, and, and last, uh, but not least, uh, creative ways to, to invest in debt and equity instruments. And, 
you know, the more I learn about one asset class, and, and Danny would probably say this too, the more it opens up relationships and, and avenues to learn about others. And, you know, the one thing I really loved about medicine and found extremely fulfilling was the constant learning. And um, well, I mean, there's a lot of things I found <laughs> fulfilling about medicine. Um, but after many conversations with physicians recently, uh, you know, about the current practice environments, uh, about they're having less and less time to really enjoy the reasons they went into medicine in the first place, um, they're, they're the simultaneous, uh, simultaneously there's demands being put on them that are uh, increasing um, and, you know, considerations for, for quality of life and being overworked and potentially being burnt out have really been kind of put on the back burner. Um, so I guess over the past, you know, two, three years, uh, increasingly physicians and other budding entrepreneurs have kind of reached out trying to understand how I and, and a few of my colleagues were able to win my time back and gain financial freedom uh, through the various investment paths that we've created. And, uh, you know, a lot of interest is obviously how do I increase my income? But, uh, but of course, um, you know, really the underlying factor was trying to get their time back and uh, practice medicine on their own terms again. So, um, because times was truly priceless if we think about it. And, and I'm a lifelong learner, uh, most physicians are, uh, and it took me years of learning from my wins and my mistakes to get where I am now, but it, it truly is my passion uh, to share this investable universe that I've discovered uh, with as many physicians as possible in order to prevent, you know, A, your burnout, but also to help you stop trading time for money and to truly practice medicine on your terms. So thanks again for having me here. Absolutely. You know, one of the most important things, there was a, a lot going on in that. So I'm going to kind of break this apart into a couple different sections um, as far as all of those different investment opportunities. But let me start kind of from the very beginning. Um, for you, the, the kind of personal tipping point, was it the autoimmune disease that was the click in your brain or the the change in your belief system where I need to solve a new problem for my family? Was it that moment in time uh, where things really clicked from you and said, I need to stop exchanging as much time for money and start finding new ways to grow income? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, I guess as they say, um, necessity is the mother of invention. So <clears throat> of course, uh, there was there was that. Uh, but I'd also in my in my previous life before medical school, I'd, I'd used real estate, I'd done some flipping, and I'd also owned some single family homes. And I saw the benefit of that, because it actually, you know, paid for quite a bit of my medical school, um, just the rental income and, and selling some of those uh, flips Absolutely. as well. But you know, I, I think it's really what got me thinking is, uh, you know, I never thought that was going to happen. And we never can foresee catastrophic life events. Right. And right. when that happened, you know, I, I told myself that no matter what direction I was going to go, it, it I was not going to let a job or a circumstance dictate my family's financial future ever again. So assets that produce cash flow, I found that could last for generations, but but jobs don't, right? So absolutely. That so that is that's, such a go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say that is such a critical comment that I just want to highlight that, you know, I, I'm a firm believer and I, I say this all the time to people, but your financial freedom, your, uh, you know, financial future is your personal responsibility, no matter Amen. what age you are, whether you are 10 years old or 90. Um, your personal financial wealth or financial freedom is your responsibility. And I love that you took charge of that. Now, probably on today's panel or whenever someone watches this recording in the future, um, they, they may be a very passionate physician without an autoimmune disease and they love what they do. And there are people who love their day job, right? They work there. I'm going to call it nine to five, but as physicians know, those hours are not quite true, uh, but they work their day job. They love what they do and they, um, they get paid a W-2 salary or a 1099 salary in return for um, putting that effort in. Now, I think what's important for people to understand, Doc, is what was your 
time allocation at the beginning. Um, were you were you transitioning your caseload and reducing your time at the in the medical profession and having more time for your entrepreneurial endeavors or what what was that time allocation split at the beginning were you working a full-time job and then investing on the side or were you working you know a quarter caseload and you had a bunch of extra time to do your entrepreneurial investing endeavors. What was that time allocation like when you were first kind of getting started um, as a physician, but wanting to build that income? The, the key piece I want to hone in on is that time allocation from month zero, because you said by month 15, you had replaced your physician income. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, you know, once again, um, my motivation <laughs> and, and, uh, my, my situation was, was a lot different than a lot of other physicians. Um, you know, when I, when I first started out, um, I, I realized that I was going to be transitioning, uh, pretty fast because of my vision, my visual condition was, was, um, my, my vision actually was deteriorating a little faster than what we thought. So um, obviously, I spent quite a time, quite a bit of time initially uh, learning and working at the same time. And, and I get that uh, folks are can get overwhelmed, and and everybody's story, everybody's situation is different than mine. Um, but rather than focus on how much time you, that you spent, and you know how many hours are um, are going to be necessary for this. Or, or kind of just jumping into the mindset of how am I going to learn all this? Because that can be really scary and, and fear can, can stop us. I'll tell you the same thing I told myself um, when I got overwhelmed more and more is just take a step. You know, a, a small step forward in the middle of fear can be very, very powerful. And it just keeps momentum moving forward. Um, now I'm, I'm full time and absolutely love what I do. I probably spend as, as little or as much time as I want. You know, my time spent on work. Um, if you will, has been increasing over the past few months because I've added on building out an educational platform and it's taken uh, quite a bit of time over what over and above what I'm usually doing. Um, but for for the you know to start out with, I would say start at your own pace. You know, my pace was a lot different than your pace. You don't have to be you don't you, you don't necessarily need to replace your income in 15 months. I was able to do that because of the pace I went at. Um, yeah. I was basically working. Um, for a time, two full-time jobs. And then I transitioned to full-time real estate very quickly. Um, you know, most of the stuff, I, what I didn't stop doing was working with missions and nonprofits, um, get a ton of fulfillment uh, still from that to this day. So there was still work there, um, but it, was, it wasn't necessarily going into the clinic and having to be somewhere from nine to five. I know that's not a, a great answer for you, but I just kind of want to encourage you that no matter where you are, you just have to take a step. Yeah, I think um, I think that's a, a good kind of segue into um, the difference between the types of investing paths that someone can take. And so, yeah. you know, what I mean by that is w when you were getting started, you took more of an active control in your your investing journey because you had to make that transition, right? You didn't really have a decision of continuing full-time in medicine because of your condition. And so I think, you know, from those listening, there's, there's really two types of paths that you can take. There's a more active path, which Dr. Mm -hmm. Danny, your journey was a lot more <laughs> active, right? I heard a couple of key things there of, you know, working two full-time jobs, hiring a mentor, being very well educated in those different investing paths, doing a lot of different investing activity, right? That is a full-time job. And that's an active strategy approach. The other approach that is available is a, a more passive approach where if, if, you are, if you are the physician who loves your job, you want to continue working your full schedule and in cases during, um, you know, every week and so on and so forth, but you want to generate some extra income on the side, 
or invest for some tax advantages to potentially reduce your taxable income, a more passive approach may be the journey um, for you. And so, Dr. Danny, maybe please explain what the differences in your mindset are between active versus passive. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, and I'll add another category, passively okay. active. Okay. <laughs> and I'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, you know, like, like Danny was saying, there's really two, two sets of definitions though when you're talking about active and passive investing. One describes your level of participation in real estate activities. And another describes your material participation from an IRS standpoint. And sometimes those get confused with each other. For, so uh, for simplicity's sake, uh, we'll kind of stick mainly to the real estate definition for the time being. Because um, I know full-time real estate professional status will be discussed at, uh, quite a bit in other sessions today. So uh, like, like Danny was saying, there, there's, there's two main forms. And one form of real estate activity is active real estate. And some of those examples for that would be think of the self-manager. Think of the person that owns the apartment complex or the single family home or the Airbnb, and they are the property manager, they are the maintenance staff, they are the groundskeeping, or at least they're hiring it out, or they're, they may be doing it themselves, or, or they are responsible. They handle the tenant calls, um, they do it all, or they delegate it, but they are the go-to person. That would be an yeah, active form a, of real estate. If a financial issue occurs, mm -hmm. you are the one to solve it. Yes. Yes. And then um, think of flippers. Flipper is another uh, form of active real estate. You can flip pretty much anything nowadays. You can flip mobile homes, you can flip multifamily, you can flip single family, you can flip land. And I've, I've actually done all four of those. Um, but, you know, anything held with an intent to resell it in less than 12 months can usually uh, be considered a flip. Um, there's some tax ramifications that, that are kind of out of the scope of this conversation that we can talk about later. Um, but, but suffice to say, there, there are some ramifications to that. Uh, another form of active is wholesaling. Um, if you've never heard of wholesaling, it's basically a wholesaler will go contract a home with the seller, and then they'll find an interested party like me or Danny uh, that wants to buy it. And then the wholesaler contracts with us. And then the arbitrage or the difference between what he contracted with the seller and us is he is what they keep as their profit. And uh, unlike flipping, real estate wholesalers don't take possession of the property and, and they really carry no virtual carrying costs, if you will. Um, and the last would be, pro go ahead, Danny, sorry. I was going to say the, the key thing, if you are considering being an active investor, I would say is figure out what your personal goals are with it. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you know, Dr. Danny, when you got started, your goal was to replace your physician generated income as quickly as possible. And mm -hmm. you took off and you learned a bunch of different things and tried a bunch of different investments. And that is the perfect scenario if you want to be active to figure out what options fit your goals. I always tell people to work backwards. So if your goal is to replace your income maybe you start out with the first investment trying to make up 25% and then you do another one and you get another 25 and you kind of chunk it out that way. So I think from an active perspective, if that's the path you want to take, there's a ton of different options available for you. You need to go and learn them. You need to go and investigate them. We rattled off many um, but you have to figure out what your personal goal is and then go find an active investment that you want to pursue to meet your goal. Don't just go try stuff. Make sure it, it meets your goal first. Yeah, and, and to understand, I guess, a little more about where your goals would lie, you kind of need to know some of the drawbacks and some of the benefits of active investing too, right? Um, I, I think- you know, Danny would tell you as well, uh, the, the main drawback of active investing is, is the headaches of tenants and, and toilets and trouble. Uh, you, you're the person that they call um, or, or your, your employee is the person they call. Um, the, the second would be um, liability. Uh, you, you need insurance. You need to carry proper liability insurance. You need to carry uh, proper property insurance. And Danny mentioned it earlier, but the finances, you're on the hook. Um, for all the, the financial obligations of the property as well. 
Now, the benefits, if you've chosen the right asset, it's probably the highest income possibility because you're getting a larger piece of the deal as an active investor. So you'll take more of the profit as well. Um, there's tax advantages. Um, we, we mentioned full-time real estate investor status. Uh, just suffice to say that's you know where you can actively or you can write off active income with passive losses. And, and the last would be autonomy. You know, you're going to be running the asset the way you want to run it. Um, but, but really, you know, what we want to talk more about is passive investing. And, and this is what you consider the, the traditional limited partner role. Um, when we're talking about real estate syndications um, or uh, an investment in something like mineral rights or some debt and equity instruments or cryptocurrency mining machines or, or even some single tenant net lease investments where they're what we call mailbox money. Really, the passive uh, investments are where you don't have any active responsibilities in order to take advantage of the profits in the upside, and you have very little or even zero responsibilities for management of the asset. Um, and I think you, you can kind of see the pros to this, right? There, there are no headaches. Those headaches are gone. You don't have the tenants, toilets, and, and trouble from tenants that you would if you were active. Um, the, the liability is... is negated or, or drastically decreased. Um, you know, most limited partnerships are exempted from any type of liability. And you, you still get, like Danny mentioned, very good tax breaks um, if the sponsor is savvy. And we can talk about sponsor um, evaluation a little later, but uh, you can take advantage of those tax breaks. Um, some of the drawbacks that I would, I would think about is if you're a control freak, uh, most anesthesiologists out there, raise your hand because <laughs> that's what we are. Um, you have very little control. So read those OAs and PPMs very carefully. It'll tell you what type of control you have. Um, the returns are good. You know, the returns are good in passive investing, especially from a, from a real estate standpoint when they're tax advantaged. Um, but they're also good with a lot of other different passive uh, income investments as well. The, the main drawback um, that you would um, incur with, a, not incur, but the main the main drawback to being passive only is you, you, you will miss out on that full-time real estate professional status. Um, but the third way I like to call, and the way I like to invest is what I call passively active. Um, this is kind of a nuanced sweet spot. It takes a little bit to get there, but um, this is where you use property management. You use strategic partnerships in addition to being a, a joint venture or a general partner on the deal, uh, but you're actually delegating the work of the, uh, the property to those partnerships. Think about the property management company that we mentioned earlier. Um, you would then manage the managers. And, and this allows you the, the full tax benefits of being an active investor from the IRS's eyes, while not really having to deal with the troubles that come along with being an active real estate investor. I mean, my goal in every asset I have is to work myself out of that job within three to six months to where it's a where it's passive income to me, but I'm in an active role from a real estate professional status. Yeah, I think, and let me know your thoughts on this, but I'm going to kind of time allocate to each of your three buckets, right? So as an active person, I would say you need to be available um, anytime during normal working hours and potentially on the weekend if issues come up uh, because you know things happen at any point in time and so you need to be generally available um, at any point in time to be an active investor to be a passive investor you don't need to be available at all um, if if you do your homework right you invest with a good group you, whenever it's right for you, you may read an email with an update or in your free time, you might look at a financial report to see how the, the asset or the investment is performing, but you have no one to report to, no availability needed, spend all your time working your day job and then the rest of it with your family and doing what you like. Uh, that third bucket, passively active, you know, I would say maybe you need to be available a, a few hours a week, um, but it could come in spurts at random times. So, you know, I would probably bucket a passively active role. You know, you need to have some availability between nine to five, Monday to Friday to answer a few questions, respond to some emails. Um, but at most, you know, maybe 
five to 10 hours a week. Does that seem pretty fair or reasonable? I think it does. Uh, and you hit the nail right on the head. I mean, you know, when you're in an acquisition mode or when you're in a refinance mode or when you're in an exit mode, obviously that's going to take a little more time. Um, when you just take over an asset and you're, you're um, going over the value add proposition with the property management company and you're uh, exacting that plan, it can take a few more hours uh, a week during those times. But for the most part, um, you, you're right on the Right on the money. Perfect. So again, I think it's important for everyone to think about <clears throat> what your personal goal is. If you, if you feel overworked, stressed out, have a growing family, um, transitioning to a move or a new job, maybe active investing is not the right time for you. Or maybe you say, I don't want to deal with any sort of tenant issue, management issue, financial issue active is not for me, but passive or maybe passively act is, is more for me. So think about your goal. Think about which of those three different um, investment buckets, active, passive, or passively active, seem appealing and start to dig in and learn a little bit more. One comment, Dr. Danny, that you made at the beginning is that you hired a mentor um, to get started with your active business. Um, Give me a recommendation if someone should hire a mentor for each of the three buckets. Should someone hire for an active, if they want to be an active investor, if they want to be a passive investor, or if they want to be passively active? Um, man, that's a really good question, Danny. Um, what I would do is I wouldn't, I would kind of lump passively active into active because I, I believe that. I would want to know um, the ins and outs of active real estate investment to decide whether I wanted to maintain an active role or an act, or a actively passive role. Um, so if I'm going to get a mentor in the active space, I think that would definitely cover both the actively and, and passive space because you generally learn both of them as an active real estate investor. Um, and finding mentors in the passive space I think there's a lot of information out there and there's a lot of disinformation out there. So, so yeah, I think that's really important. It's important for somebody to be able to guide you through what to look for when you're evaluating the sponsor, what to look for when you're underwriting, you know, underwriting their underwriting, if you will. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, a mentor in the active space and a mentor in the passive space would definitely um, really give you 10, 20, 30 X your return on that investment. And what would be a way for someone to uh, find a mentor? Is it different between an active mentor and a passive mentor? Yeah, um, well, what we did is we sought out people who were doing it very, very well in the space. Um, and, and we did that through uh, word of mouth. We did that through uh, searches. We did that through evaluating their deal flow and their deal cycles and figured out these guys really know what they're doing. We're going to reach out to them and see if they'll mentor us. Um, so, so that's how we went through our process. Um, there are a, a, you know, several groups out there right now. Um, I can't really name them off, but there are several groups out there that can be found that are actually doing active mentors. Um, you can feel free to reach out to me and we can have a conversation uh, if, you're, if you're thinking about diving into real estate um, or other passive or active investments. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's there's plenty of, of avenues um, to reach uh, folks out there that are that are training up the the next kind of generation of, of investors. Perfect. And then from a passive investing strategy, let's talk a little bit about how to properly vet um, a passive investment opportunity and uh, what you think is important to look for when evaluating a passive investment opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm gonna lean on you on this as well because I know you answer questions ad nauseum every day. So you probably have some questions that I wouldn't even think of. Um, but you know, when you're looking at, you know, we'll say an apartment syndication opportunity, the first thing you have to do, um, I don't know where everybody's, uh, where everybody is on the spectrum right now, as far as starting out or, or level of sophistication, but you need to educate yourself on the key terms that you're going to be reading. Um, 
you know, know the terms and definitions. Uh, so you have a working knowledge, you know what NOI is, you know what cap rates are, you know what P&Ls are and how to read them. You know what a cash on cash return is versus a IRR and, and what the difference is between those. Um, preferred returns, different types of share classes, those types of things. Really kind of dig in and, and understand the terms before you, you, you know anything else in the, in the, uh, in the game. Um, fees and, and skin in the game of the sponsors. You'll hear that a lot too. You know, what are the sponsors charging? And how much will the sponsor be putting in to the deal of their own money? You know, it's, it's fairly common for a sponsor to put anywhere between 3 and 15% based on the size of the deal. Um, so th those are important things. What types of fees are they charging? There's, there's all kinds of fees. There's acquisition fees. There's um, loan or, or debt signing fees. Uh, there's, there's disposition fees when you go to sell. There's construction management fees. And those can get pretty exorbitant depending on the size of the rehab budget and the heavy lift, uh, or if, it's, if the value add is a heavy lift. Um, there's organizational and operational fees, all kinds of fees. So, so make sure that you ask those questions. And you know, most importantly, you wanna evaluate the, the sponsor or, or the general partner that's bringing you the deal. You know, how many deals have they exited? Uh, how long have they been operating? Did um, their performas uh, meet expectations on their exit? Will they show you those P&Ls so you don't just see like the, the four lines that they send you? Will they show you the P&Ls so you can evaluate the returns yourself? Um, did they have any deals go bad? And then what guardrails have they put up now so they don't repeat that mistake in the future? Um, really, any questions you're asking and they say, well, we can't give you that information, that's generally a red flag, uh, depending on what information you're at. If you're asking for their social security number, then that's a little too much. But for most questions, um, they should generally should be able to answer them for you. Um, look at their pro forma and their numbers. Is their underwriting realistic? You know, we're in a historic bull market right now. Are they still planning for a lower exit cap rate or a 10% rent bump? Like rents grew 11% last year. That's not tenable. So if their performance says that rents are going to grow 10%, that's a red flag. Do they have a, a clear plan for their um, value add? And, you know, that's going to create that margin, that equity to give you the profit in the deal. Um, what's their... Uh, the, what's their waterfall structure? How do you get paid? Yeah. And um, one of the things that I love about PassiveInvesting.com is most of their deals, um, their, re, their preferred return come to you as a return of, uh, is a distribution and not a return of capital. And, and Danny can talk a little bit more about that, but that's important. And the last thing I'd mention is, you know, what are your voting rights? Um, worst case scenario, the sponsor uh, goes off the rails. <laughs> is there a way to remove the sponsor? Um, those are things that kind of look that I look at generally. Yeah, I think all of those are great. A couple that immediately come to mind, you know, if I was to evaluate any investment and I, I always kind of think about it as like, you go and talk to a, a stock broker, right? And they're trying to sell you on a stock. If you typically ask them, how much of your own personal money are you putting in? They they usually don't have a good answer or they probably haven't put any money in. And so my first question, just being a financially minded person, um, I would always ask, how much is the GP putting into the deal? That would be a great starting question. Um, my other you know, belief around this is real estate investing is not medicine. It is not complicated. There, there are issues that come up, but it is nowhere near, you know, being in an operating room and having a, a patient's life on the line. So, you know, take a breath. It's not rocket science here. It's not medicine. It is just investing. And I would, would urge someone if you're evaluating a sponsor or looking at an investment opportunity and you cannot understand their business plan or answer all of your questions in about two to five minutes where you have a, a good feeling that you know what's going on, you know what their approach is and their philosophy, then I would walk away from that group. 
again, real estate is not complicated. It's very straightforward. Um, if, if you are looking at, you know, quality investments that are conservative in nature, um, it's very simple and straightforward to explain and have you understand. And I think that's a requirement of a good GP um, to be able to explain what the critical business plan is and how it's being supported and how you are mitigating unnecessary risks. And so that would be my, my last piece of advice is if the conversation drags on way too long um, and you leave that confused, then that group is not for you. Yeah, Danny, um, you know, one of the things that when I'm talking to, to docs and I, I fought it my whole life is we get into analysis paralysis, you know, and a lot of it has to do with that's what we're taught, right? I mean, if we're not 100% correct, I mean, literally people could, could have bad outcomes. So yep. we're taught to just really, really uh, interrogate opportunities pretty well. And, you know, what I would say is like Danny said, learn enough to prove the concept and jump in. If you need to be 100% about every investment before making the decision to invest, you're really going to miss out on some good opportunities is what's going to happen. Right. Um, you know, if you've read about the space and you have a very good idea of what's going on in the space, um, you feel it's a good deal, jump in. You, you don't have to spend your life's earnings, uh, but I'd say put enough in that it's it, it may hurt a little bit if you lose it because it'll keep you interested and you'll learn. And where your money goes, it's where your mind follows generally. Um, so, you know, investments are, you know, look at every investment as an opportunity for an education as well. And the more knowledge and experience you gain, the better investor you're going to be. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Um, shifting gears a little bit, what are a couple of uh, like common myths about real estate investing or just investing in general that, that we should kind of debunk or kind of set the stage right after, you know, your personal experience? What, what were some myths that maybe you had been told early before you got really actively started in real estate? And, you know, what did you learn about them through actual real experience? Yeah. Um, man, there's so many, uh, where do you start? <laughs> there, there's a great book. One. Yeah. There's a great book. I recommend killing sacred cows uh, by Garrett Gunderson. It, it goes through all these myths and that, that's what it is. All, all the myths that we've been taught in, in our financial education. One, I just start out with it's, you know, everybody says it's risky. Um, you know, it's real estate's risky. Well, in actuality, it, it's very, very stable. Um, Real estate has probably, it does probably, it is the, the lowest volatility asset class that there are out there. Um, and it's usually high volatility that, that kill a lot of stock players, right? When the markets goes up and down, people always sell low and buy high. Um, so volunteer, volatility will kill you. Well, the real estate market is, is, is quite unique in that respect. Um, it also has the highest risk adjusted return out of any asset class as well. Um, don't know if you guys are familiar with the sharp ratio, but basically it's a, it's a risk adjusted measure that um, compares across asset classes. The lower the number, the better. Well, real estate has the lowest sharp ratio uh, of any asset class. Um, it really gives you um, unmatched economic cycle protection that you just can't find in, in really any other asset class, especially the stock market. Um, you know, triple A plus life insurance companies both lend and invest in this space. Um, historically, the foreclosure rate in multifamily, I think it ticked up a little bit with um, COVID, but not much. I think it's less than 1.6% uh, historically. Um, you know, single family homes, uh, mobile home parks, those are those can actually even be lower. It's, it's a very solid asset class. Yeah, I think just from a high level, you know, investing in cash flow producing real estate assets, mm really yeah. makes sense when the population in the US is growing. Um, depending on what market you invest in, I would personally invest in markets where there's job growth and population growth. And with a growing population where more than half of the population chooses to rent, you have a very good um, mix of supply and demand. You have more demand for people renting because there's more people. There's more people moving to your market. 
and they need a place to rent. And the, the supply is very finite of rental options available. And so you have a good economic environment to keep your investment, your property rented and generating cash flow. And that's the name of the game is just continue to generate cash flow. Yeah, um, sure. Shifting um, gears a little bit, I know we've got um, about 15 minutes left. So I want to save a little bit of time for questions. If anyone has questions, um, please ask them in the chat box, in the Q&A box. Dr. Danny, I'll take this. Um, I'll try to field all these questions. I know the technology stuff can be challenging. Yeah. So I just do my best to keep my screen organized over here. But um, let's talk a little bit about what next steps someone should take if they're looking to just get started. And, um, and, and maybe we can talk briefly a couple of next steps for active, but maybe we'll focus more on the passive or passively active group. So a, a new person who mm -hmm. listens to this webinar and they are like, I need to go out and make some, some more income from investment income versus trading my time. So how do they get started? Yeah. Um, well, the first thing I always tell people, Danny, is, is to read voraciously. And physicians are pretty good at that. Um, it, it's the easiest way uh, to learn from what others have done, right? Um, it doesn't mean you have to do what they do, but it's a great way uh, to learn the space. And it's a very cheap form of education. Um, books like, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Cashflow Quadrant uh, by Robert Kiyosaki. I mentioned earlier, Killing Sacred Cows by uh, Garrett Gunderson. Uh, Tax-Free Wealth by Tom Wheelwright really changed my life, uh, changed the direction of my family's life. It was a very powerful book for me. Uh, the Lifestyle Investor by Justin Donald um, can really start to change your mindset. And really, we need to be deprogrammed from our, what our financial system has really programmed into our heads our entire lives. Um, so that's a first step. And, you know, we've talked about it a little bit, but to really accelerate your path um, to financial freedom, what we did and what I recommend is finding a good coach, a good mentor, a good mastermind group uh, to mentor under. Um, you know, we found mentors in the space. We learned from them and we got the benefit of learning from their mistakes. And that's huge. I know we haven't talked about wins and losses yet, but that was huge in our, our, our journey is learning from their mistakes. And, you know, they generally aren't cheap, but it was a whole lot cheaper than, than doing it myself and making all those mistakes. And, um, you know, this method can vastly accelerate your growth curve and, and really expand your network. And when you increase your network, you increase your knowledge and your access to deals. And um, you can get involved in investment classes that you just never knew existed. I know I did, right? Um, I mean, I mentioned earlier, but I think finding coaches and, and mentors can, you know, 10, 20, sometimes 100x your investment in a very, very short amount of time. Um, yeah, the, the adage old <laughs> saying of always your, your net worth is equal to your net work, mm -hmm. you know, just expanding on that, meeting new people, learning about what they're doing, um, really some of the best ways to get started. One thing I want to just dive a little bit deeper into, you know, uh, you mentioned some of the critical like wins and losses. So maybe explain a little bit about um, something that went really well, and then maybe some lessons on that loss side that you learned along the way. Yeah. Um, you know, I've had, I guess, kind of getting a little philosophical. I think we've had if we've been on this call, we've had some financial wins with real estate. Um, and, and I think there's, you know, a reason most people create, build and, and grow their, their generational wealth through real estate. Um, but the biggest win I've had, Danny, was just finding margin again in my life. Um, being financially free through having multiple different income streams has really enabled me to live a life I never thought was possible. Um, you know, we had, we had the, the goal of not giving our kids stuff. You know, we, we wanted to have experiences in our family. We found ourselves that we were so busy that we ended up kind of uh, backtracking into giving them stuff. And, you know, when I've able to build the time and the margin to, to have in our lives, you know, we were able to do really cool things as, as a family. Um, we've seen all 50 states in, in an RV with my family Beautiful. just because of 
um, you know, and we're able to do like epic adventures for milestone birthdays, um, just stuff that we've always wanted to do. And I, I don't miss big events. I don't have to miss a sporting event unless I want to. Um, and another thing very strong in my life is my faith. And it's allowed me to be super generous with my money and, and my time. That really fills me up. So, you know, having money work for me rather than the other way around has probably been the, the biggest win through this journey. Um, I've definitely. had, if you want a, you know, a financial win, I can give you that as well. Um, there's, there's been, you know, a few that I can, I can think about. Obviously, you know, through the philosophical wins, we know that that investments go well and, yeah. you know, money grows and doubles. Let's talk a little bit about maybe some of the challenges um, that you've faced and learned and uh, grown through. Yeah, the, the first would be, or well, the, the main one I've been for uh, in consideration of time here, I'll just, I'll just talk about one because yep. I don't need to embarrass myself in front of all these people too often. So um, this is a due diligence nightmare. Um, we, we bought, we, at, at the time we bought over 300 units and we were getting our feet under us pretty well at this point. And we had a system for evaluating opportunities that was working well for us. Um, we had another opportunity come our way and uh, we were super slammed, but it was a very, very good deal. And um on the surface anyway, and they wanted a, a, somebody that can close fast. And that should have been our first alarm bell, right? But they had an excuse. I can't remember what the excuse was, but we, but we still should have had our spidey senses up. Um, we, we started implementing our due diligence process and a few alarms went off. There were some metrics on crimes in schools that we probably should have paid a little better attention to. They weren't deal killers, but they were important. Uh, we had other assets in the vicinity though that were doing well. So we kind of chalked it up as to us knowing the submarket better than you know the national guys did and we moved forward. And like I said, it was a great price and we didn't want to follow to escrow. Um, so we started leaning on our property management company more so than usual. Um, and trusting them a little more in the due diligence process. We didn't interview the tenants or, or talk to the contractors or that were performing the due diligence, not blaming this on the property management company by any means. I mean, it's our yeah. job. But yeah. most importantly, you know, we didn't get camera studies done on sewer systems um, in apartments that sit on concrete slabs with no crawl spaces. So you can see where this is going, right? Yeah. Um, found a six-figure sewer issue uh, after we had closed. And if we had not had an equity partner on this deal, it would have been pretty scary. Um, so the, the moral of the story is develop your system and stick to it. Um, I mean, if we needed more time to complete due diligence nowadays, we would just get the seller to sign an addendum and that would be that. And it wouldn't be worth making another six figure mistake. We would walk away. And, you know, from a passive standpoint, it's totally OK to have someone else complete it. And, it, and it's totally OK to entrust anyone or excuse me, uh, totally, totally OK to entrust uh, someone else to complete it totally. But make sure. Um, whoever it is that either you or your sponsor has worked with them before and they know and will be accountable if not the, if things aren't found. Um, we didn't do that. So uh, the worst part was the guys that mentored us, I mean, they, they just drilled us into our heads uh, many, many times. We still made the mistake. So we ended up getting out from underneath it. Um, but if we had investors that had a preferred return or something like that, uh, we basically would have worked for free. So uh, due, due diligence is a very, very important part of the process. And so when, as from a passive standpoint, you need to know your sponsor's due diligence and you can kind of evaluate that in reverse engineering by just seeing the deals they've completed and, yeah. and how they've worked out. Absolutely. I think, again, it kind of goes back to, you know, real estate is not complicated. It's not mm -hmm. like medicine. There's not unknown variables that could occur um, you know, any sort of challenge in real estate has been, um, persevered before us. Um, so having a network, having professionals that yeah. you can call and say, Hey, here's an issue I'm having. How have you encountered it? You'll probably get some good direction there. Um, with that, Dr. Danny, tell us what you're up to now. Give us any kind of closing remarks. And I'm going to check in the Q&A box and the chat box for anyone. Um, please feel free to ask some questions. We've got about five minutes left here. So give us a couple closing remarks about what you're up to now and uh, what you're focused on. And then we will jump into some questions. Cool. Um, 
Yeah, like I said earlier, this is something I've been really thinking about for a long time. And when I spoke with Dan several months ago, wanting to set up an avenue uh, to work specifically with physicians and, and other entrepreneurs who wanted to stop trading their time for money, I, I was excited that you know this conference was born. Um, as a physician, uh, I, I know the pain of being pulled in the, like 100 different directions and, and reimbursements getting cut and having autonomy slowly chipped away. And, and most importantly, just kind of not feeling like you have enough time. And there's that pressure um, to be the main earner of your household. And, and that's how burnout starts. So it's a real problem in our medical community. And, and you know, I understand money doesn't solve all problems, but it, but it helps with the financial ones, right? Um, so once your cash flow outweighs your expenses and you are free to do you want, uh, you know, life changes. And that financial freedom can really lift weight off people. So if I can give uh, an avenue for, for docs uh, to increase their passive income to where it outpaces their active eventually, then they'll likely stay practicing and, and love it, not because um, they're beholden to it, but because they can practice on their own terms. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm really looking to build a, a network or, or really utilize my network that I've created over the years uh, to help work with folks and, and really help them create passive income streams uh, where they will eventually outpace their active income so they can practice medicine and, and kind of live life on their own terms. So that's kind of what I've been up to, um, just, just working on that. Beautiful. How can people get in touch with you? Um, oh, well, I'm in the middle of creating my platform right now. Um, the, the best way to connect with me is to go to my website, uh, thecashflowmd.com or dannybramermd.com. And uh, there's, there's a few questions there you can fill out. Let me know what current situation that you're in, and then we can set up time to talk about it. Uh, you know, there's no pressure, no cost, no obligations or anything, just a conversation to see if it'd be a fit working together to help reach your goals. Beautiful. Yeah. And um, one of the questions in here, again, if anyone has questions, feel free to ask Q&A box or the chat box. I'll try to monitor both. Um, can you rattle off the books again, maybe give us, you know, I think we said, uh, rich dad, poor dad, Robert Kiyosaki cash flow quadrant. The question was, uh, you, you rattled them off a little too quick. Uh, Sorry. what other books do you recommend? Uh, so yeah, I think, uh, rich dad, poor dad, by, uh, Robert Kiyosaki cash flow quadrant is also by Robert Kiyosaki, uh, tax-free wealth by Tom Wheelwright. Um, Killing Sacred Cows by Garrett Gunderson. Please don't ask me to spell that name. Um, and The Lifestyle Investor by Justin Donald uh, or, or some that, that pop into mind right now. Perfect. That should do it. All right. A couple of questions in here. Um, what is the benefit of being a real estate professional status? <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, there, there's, there's basically a, um, a definition of a, of a full-time real estate professional that you kind of have to go over a little bit. Um, and, and just real briefly, um, the definition of a full-time real estate professional from an IRS standpoint means you have to meet several qualifications. The, the two main ones that you under, need to understand are more than 50% of your personal services that you perform in, in all businesses uh, must be performed in real estate um, and that you are, you materially participate in. So that's where uh, a limited partner generally would not qualify because they're not materially participating. The other hurdle is you must work uh, 750 hours in real estate trade or business. But the main benefit to this designation are pretty vast and um, suffice to say they can lead to negating uh, most, if not all of your active income or your spouse's active income, where you may never pay federal income tax again. Um, I can give them a quick example if we have time, but that, suffice to say, that's the biggest bonus. So the best benefit is that tax advantage that yeah. a full-time real estate professional can get. Perfect. Um, yeah, you can use questions... passive losses to offset active income. That's a critical component. Passive losses to offset active income. It's a question for you, you personally as an individual, but also your CPA. Um, mm. One question in here that I'll take, Dr. Danny, um, COVID laws around the challenges for landlords with non-paying tenants is now a bad time to invest in rentals. No, it's not. Buying the right 
asset is what you need to do your homework on. So buying in a good location, buying a good property, I wouldn't recommend that you buy a, um, a property in a challenging area or with really low rents that um, have, have um, lower earning um, tenant mixes. So um, no, now is not a, a bad time to invest. Do your homework, find something that fits your goals. Um, give us a quick review and closing here. A couple of passive income sources outside of real estate. I know at the beginning we mentioned um, something about like crypto or crypto mining, but what just rattle a couple non real estate passive income investment options. Um, yeah, so there is mineral rights. Um, you're actually going to hear from Troy Eckert today about that. Um, there is debt and equity instruments that you can invest in. Um, like I said, you can reach out more. We can talk about that. I, we're not going to really have time to talk about that in the scope of things at this point. Um, there are um, different, um, um, I, I guess, market strategies that I consider passive, it's active income, but it takes very, very, very little of my time. Um, there are, um, uh, I'm just trying to, to think of- I think a, that's the rest perfect. Of the there's, a, yeah. there's a ton of different ways to make money out there, mm -hmm. um, whether it's passively active, passive or active. So yeah. do your homework, get into some blogs, reach out, connect with Dr. Danny. The last question I do want to have, unless Andrew chimes in here that we're over, but this one is really important. Um, being a physician, um, a lot of people probably grow up in a family that has tremendous passion and pride in, um, in leading that life in medicine. So what did your family think um, when you were pivoting your career and um, what do they think now about your decision to, and, and let's take your situation off the table personally, but um, what, what may someone encounter from a, a family belief of, you know, getting into this other way to make money than just serving patients? Hmm. Um, personally, my, my immediate family, my wife, my kids, everybody was very, very supportive. And as you can imagine, though, my situation was a little bit different. And, and it also, uh, you know, harkens back to our faith as well. Uh, you know, we felt very, very at peace as what was going on. And we felt like there were doors being opened that we were walking through. Um, I'm still a physician. I still love medicine. I still, you know, I went back to medical school in order to be more active in missions. And as it would have it, I'm more active in missions than I ever have been before. So, you know, I, I don't feel like it was a, a, a pivot so much as just a, a growth of where I already was. Um, you know, I haven't lost that, that, um, that moniker of, of being a physician. I'm, I'm still board certified, actually, um, in anesthesia. Don't practice it anymore, but still board certified. So it, it's, it's been a great transition. And my family was unbelievably supportive. Yeah. Perfect way to close things out. I'll just, I'll leave it with, um, you know, people have opinions about um, what it is that you may do or, or what your, your passions are, what you're driving towards. But uh, again, you know, surrounding yourself with those who support you is, um, mm. is extremely important. And, uh, yeah. you know, having that belief in yourself to accomplish uh, what you put your mind to and what you're trying to build and grow for mm. is um, absolutely critical. So um, just don't be deterred by someone who has a uh, negative um, opinion about what you may be trying to do. Just, just stay focused on uh, what it is that you are doing. With that, um, give us your website one more time, Dr. Danny. And um, that is the last question I have in here. I know we're a couple minutes over. Yeah, it's uh, thecashflowmd.com or dannybramermd.com. And Bramer spelled B-R-A-M-E-R. Beautiful. 
All right, let's bring back Mr. Andrew Davis. Um, did we miss anything? What do you got for us? You know, so you went over, but I didn't have the heart to cut you off because it was so <laughs> good. It was so good. So we good. Uh, we built we built some margin in between each one of the sessions, and uh, I'll tell you. I, it was such a good conversation and there's so many places that I wanted to jump in and say, amen, or can you repeat that? Uh, so I would highly encourage, and I just want to remind everybody because just a tremendous amount of value in that hour and five minutes, everybody that's watching this, these will be recorded. I will be going back to watch this again. Uh, so many, so many amazing points hit on from the, the distinctions between active and passive and aligning what you're doing with your values, evaluating sponsors, different ways to get involved based on your lifestyle and goals. And just, so thank you both, Danny. Thanks for, for interviewing, moderating Dr. Danny, uh, amazing story. Thank you so much for just sharing all your wisdom, experience, insights. Really, really oh, good. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. Much appreciate it. Yeah, no. This is tremendous. So yeah, we're going to, y'all can jump off at your leisure. I'm going to just um, chat with everybody about what's coming up next. Thank you so much.